everyone, and good evening. Welcome to Doheny Memorial Library for the 2012 USC Library Scripture Ceremony. I can remember standing here four years ago for my very, very first scripture, and it just gets to be more fun, and I'm so glad to see all of you this evening. It really is wonderful to welcome so many longtime supporters and new friends to honor excellent writers and writing, celebrate the unique art of cinematic adaptation, and highlight the contributions of our great libraries to the excellence of the entirety of the University of Southern California. I have to say that I am excited and a little bit nervous. And all those people slapping me on the back at the reception earlier saying, you're going to do just great. I know you meant it well, but it really doesn't help that much. <laughs> so I am returning as your Masters of Ceremonies this year. Naomi Foner and I had a little discussion about whether I should be Mistress of Ceremonies or Master of Ceremonies. And I do believe that actresses these days like to be called actors. So I guess that makes me your Master of Ceremonies. I have some very, very big shoes to fill, coming after such masters of ceremonies as Jason Alexander and Jamie Lee Curtis. And in the case of last year's MC, Nancy Sinatra, some very large boots to fill. Oh, you laughed? Oh, good. <laughs> the role of master of ceremonies comes with many expectations, on my part and on yours. You expect that I will be entertaining, that I will be funny, and that I will get you out of here by 10 p.m. I expect that all of you will work with me and applaud and laugh at all the appropriate moments. And I'll, hey! <laughs> I was gonna say, I'll let you know when the appropriate moments arrive, but apparently I don't need to do that. <laughs> now I am very pleased to welcome some very special guests. Would you please stand as I call your name and remain standing so that we can recognize you as a group. Chairman of the USC Board of Trustees, Edward P. Roski Jr. and his wife, Gail. <laughs> USC Trustee, Dr. Verna B. Dotrieve, who is also a member of the USC Library's Dean's Council. <laughs> this whole welcoming them as a group never really works, does it, Ed? USC trustee, Carol Fox. <laughs> USC trustee, Kathleen McCarthy and her husband, Frank Costlin. <laughs> USC trustee, Lorna Reed and her husband, Chuck. <laughs> USC trustee, Ronald Sugar and his wife, Valerie. Ron and Valerie are also members of the USC Libraries Dean's Council and Valerie serves on the Friends of the USC Libraries Board of Directors. Tom Sales, Senior VP of University Relations. <laughs> Executive Vice President Michael Quick. Dean Madeline Puzo of the USC School of Theater, who was also a member of the 2012 Scripture Selection Committee. And CIO and USC Vice Provost for Information Technology, Eileen Rimes and his wife, Vera. Thank you to all of you for joining us on this very special occasion. Before I continue, I'd like to say just a few more words about two of the people I just introduced. When I last stood before you on this stage, I did so as Catherine Quinlan, the Dean of the University of Southern California Libraries. Well, I am still the Dean. However, this year, something is different. A very important event recently occurred. And tonight, thanks to the inspiring generosity of Valerie and Ron Sugar, I stand before you as Catherine Quinlan Dean and the inaugural holder of the Valerie and Ronald Sugar Dean's Chair of the USC Libraries. With their tremendous gift, Valerie and Ron have ensured that the libraries will be able to contribute even more to the intellectual excellence and academic achievements of every Trojan, in every school, in every field of study on campus for generations to come. I am thrilled that Valerie and Ron are with us tonight and I'd like to invite this room full of library enthusiasts to join me in thanking them for their support, their confidence, and their bold dedication to USC and to our libraries. Um, those of you who are able to attend the inaugural um, installation of the chair know that Ron Sugar is a really, really, really funny guy. 
And I told him that if I bomb tonight, he's coming up here next year. <laughs> oh, no, not more of that. <laughs> Each year, almost immediately after the scripture ceremony, the event committee begins considering ways to make the following year even better. Following scripture two years ago, the committee suggested that we establish the role of honorary dinner chairs, and two very special people accepted our invitation. I was sorry that they were not able to attend last year's ceremony. However, I am very happy that Taylor Hackford and Helen Mirren are able to join us this evening. <laughs> Taylor Hackford is no stranger to the Trojan family. He graduated from USC as an international relations major and volunteered with the Peace Corps before beginning his career as a filmmaker. And what a career it has been. He has served on juries for the Venice Film Festival and is currently the president of the Directors Guild of America. If you were inspired by the story of Ray Charles in Ray, or if you swooned over Richard Gere in An Officer and a Gentleman, you and I have Taylor Hackford to thank. <laughs> Helen Mirren has acted in more Shakespeare dramas than most of us have read. In film, on television, and on the stage, she has played a history textbook's worth of formidable women. Cleopatra, Ayn Rand, Queen Elizabeth I, and the second. In her 1984 film, Cal, she played perhaps her most formidable character of all, a librarian named Marcella. Please join me in welcoming our Scripter Honorary Dinner co-chairs, Taylor Hackford and Helen Mirren. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we are thrilled to be the honorary chairs of tonight's event. Last week, as Catherine said, last year we were not able to be here because we were both working. So it's all the more sweet that we can be here tonight. Uh, I know this room well because as a freshman here at USC, I spent a lot of time here. I roomed in a dormitory right behind this building called Mark's Hall which was fondly referred to around campus as the zoo <laughs> because it's where uh, they stabled the uh, athletic scholarship students. <laughs> now, it was a little difficult for me because I was here on an, on an academic scholarship, and uh, this group did not uh, spend a lot of time studying, uh, so I needed a, a place to come, and, and Doheny Library was my salvation. In reality, however, this library is a lot more than a bastion of silence, a haven of silence. It is, in fact, a resource, a huge resource that has wonderful, wonderful assets for our business, our community, our art form. I'll turn that over to my wife. Well, obviously, with the internet today, people think they can find everything online. <laughs> However, the kind of material to be found here in this library, <laughs> the visual details, the cross-referencing, the depth of extraordinary research information makes it a vital tool in the art form of filmmaking or drama. In my research, for example, for a character, I need both pictures and words the books in this library are of far more value than any page of Wikipedia. Any artist working in our world has his or her own library of reference built books built up over the years. To us, this place is a treasure trove. It's Atlantis, it's Alexandria, it's Sibylla, containing immeasurable wealth, the wealth of information, Writers, production designers, costume designers, prop masters, makeup artists, and yes, actors and directors can all find correct information in these rooms. What did Sophia Tolstoy's private shrine look like? What were the preferred feathers of the Inca in their clothing? What kind of hair was used in Louis XIV's wig? What was the architectural design of the Chinese emperor's forbidden city? How much gold did Cortez carry back to the Spanish court? And more than information, we can find inspiration. 
there is something tactile and, and, and involving in seeing the words or the image on a page. We can observe and absorb. We can take that information and we can fly with it into the realms of imagination. You know, when Prospera was put on the leaking boat to die, the only things she wanted with her were her books and her daughter. Everything else she could do without. I truly hope we are not on a leaky boat about to face the storm, but we are all Prospero and Prospera, and we need our books. Thank you, Helen and Taylor. If you have spent any time studying or teaching here, visiting our libraries, participating in our events, or engaging with USC in any way, you know that every member of the USC community has a passion to excel. That drive, that persistent and uniquely USC combination of both ambitions and meaningful deeds comes from many sources. President Nikias and the group of university leaders working with him to shape the future of USC with great vision and commitment. Our excellent staff, eminent faculty, and ambitious students. And I believe the people, places, and collections of our libraries. After all, as President Nikias recently said, and I believe I heard the chairman of the trustees say this as well, it is impossible to have a great university without a great library. And of course, I agree. President Achaeus, Provost Garrett, and the Board of Trustees recently shared the university's new strategic vision with the USC community. That vision describes three areas of endeavor that will contribute to USC's continuing ascent. Connecting the individual to the world, creating scholarship with consequence, and transforming education for a rapidly changing world. Making and discovering meaningful connections. Supporting scholarship of great significance and enabling research and teaching that is truly transformative. That is what an excellent library does for a great university. For 24 years, Scripter has showcased the exemplary creative work our libraries seek to aspire. We have had authors like Michael Shabon on this stage to share stories of writing and conducting research in this very room. Oscar-winning screenwriters like Simon Beaufoy have told us how meaningful Scripter is because it is the only honor of its kind that exclusively celebrates writers and because it is awarded by a great library at a great institution. And James Cameron has gone on record, in popular mechanics no less, saying that he began learning about the technology of special effects by consulting the dissertations in our cinematic arts library. That we have inspired the creators of the amazing adventures of Cavalier and Clay, Slumdog Millionaire, and Titanic, not to mention Avatar and the, and the Terminator certainly demonstrates the significance and enduring value of libraries like ours. In our libraries, you can discover the connections among Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, and the Victorian Gothic themes that inform a story like Jane Eyre. You can enjoy impressive first novels like The Descendants and densely detailed true stories like Moneyball. You can explore the results of artistic transformation by following the creative evolution of a dangerous method as it was adapted from a play, which was adapted from a piece of nonfiction, which was itself informed by the letters of Freud and Jung. Or Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy, which has appeared as a novel, a film, a television series, and a radio play. And its very title is adapted from a children's nursery rhyme. The authors and screenwriters of these books, plays, stories, and screenplays, selected from among the writers of a record 109 eligible films this year, embody the stellar, transformative accomplishments our libraries inspire and make possible. And because our libraries help every USC student, faculty member, and member of our staff achieve their greatest ambitions, all of you who have joined us this evening are supporting the academic and artistic excellence of this entire university. You are contributing to the remarkable transformation underway at USC, and you are helping make possible the many more sure to come. On behalf of everyone at the USC Libraries, thank you.
Now I would like to introduce the man whose spark of inspiration began the journey that has brought us here tonight. Glenn Sonnenberg and Maggie Lord Vogue worked with then Dean Charles Richardson to co-found Scripter in 1988. Their purpose was to recognize writers and screenwriters of tremendous talent and to showcase our library's role in informing and inspiring their work. Over the last 24 years, Glenn has worked tirelessly with Maggie and the Friends Board to transform Scripter into the distinguished Trojan tradition it is today. In addition to serving as president of Latitude Management Real Estate Investors, Glenn is a former USC, USC trustee, past president of the Alumni Association's Board of Governors, and current member of the Board of Counselors for the USC Gould School of Law and the Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences. He is the founding president of the USC Junior Associates and serves on the board of directors of the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. Governor Jerry Brown recently appointed Glenn to the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum Commission. But perhaps most importantly, Glenn is also the president of the Friends of the USC Libraries Board of Directors. He leads the Friends with great enthusiasm, and I might add, great panache, and devotes enormous energy to the libraries and all of the University of Southern California. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Glenn Sonnenberg. Thank you very much. That's exactly how I wrote it. <laughs> I'd like to thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you all of you for joining us. But you know, I have my, my um, teenage son is actually here today. He, he's an actor at school, and just as I was about to come up, he said, break a leg, Dad, don't mess up. <laughs> thank you, Brad. As we begin our celebration tonight, I'd like to take a few moments to remember two members of the Scripture family whom we lost this year. First, Hal Cantor served us as our Scripture Master of Ceremonies and Grand Master of Ceremonies for many years. Those of you who have been with us know that Scripture has grown and evolved and know that it, one constant during those years was Hal's sometimes unpredictable, sometimes salty, but always entertaining gift for making this audience laugh. Hal wrote comedy for the Academy Awards ceremonies, emceed galas for the Directors Guild, and always be, will be remembered as an iconic comedic talent of the golden age of television and radio. Charles Richardson also passed away this year. Charles was dean of the USC libraries at the time of Scripture's founding, and he worked closely with Maggie Volk and me to bring this event to fruition. He was a professor of history, a diplomat, and worked in the United States and around the world to promote the importance of the arts and the humanities. When he retired from USC in 1990, he had made tremendous progress in preparing the USC libraries for the electronic future. And his vision for a new kind of physical library had prepared much of the groundwork for what would become Levy Library a few years later. I remember Charles with particular affection. Not only was he the guy who got me involved with the USC libraries, but he was also a professor of mine in Tudor Stewart, England. I'm still mad at him for giving me only an A minus. His impact on my time as a history major here at USC, no doubt, was experienced by many other students whom he touched. Please join me in acknowledging the many contributions to Scripter, the libraries, and the USC by Hal Cantor and Charles Richardson. At the risk of turning this evening into prolonged obituaries, I'd like to also acknowledge the passing of two other remarkable individuals this past year. The first is Jack Hubbard, president of USC during the 1980s. He was the first person I heard who described Doheny and the libraries as the heart of the university. His salty humor could rival both Hal Cantor's riffs at Scripters and, at James, and James Elroy's acceptance speech several years ago. Finally, I'd like to remember a man whom I owe so much, including funding years of my education at USC and support of the first Scripter dinners, who taught me the value of hard work and the written word, my father, Bill Sonnenberg. Ours was a home filled with books, carefully maintained and displayed, and I'll always remember him sitting in his study, glasses perched on his nose, engaged in reading. Now back to our program. Dean Quinlan asked me to try at this point to kind of lighten up the mood a little bit with one of her favorite library jokes. So I'm not gonna tell the one about the librarian who slipped and fell in the library. She wandered into the non-friction section. No, instead, instead, I'm going to tell her favorite. 
about a 10-year-old child who walked up to the librarian's counter, and he'd seen this setup before, and he said with glee, he goes to the counter and he yells, I'll have a cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. Shh, says the assistant. This is a library. You must be quiet. He says, sorry, and he whispers, I'll have cheapers, cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. Come on. <laughs> okay, this is not my day job. In 1988, the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Lakers each won national championships in their respective sports. Lemon-flavored Snapple iced tea first appeared on the shelves. Thank you, Hugh. The world was mere months away from learning that Millie and Vanilli were not actually singing. And the Scripter Selection Committee awarded the first ever Scripter to the authors and screenwriters of 84 Charing Cross Road. It was fitting that the inaugural scripter honored a story about books and the incredible influence they can have on our lives. Also in 1988, Jane Eyre turned 140, but Jane Charlotte Bronte's words were just as fresh as they were when first printed. The Oakland Athletics had not yet heard of Billy Bean. The Iron Curtain described in John Le Carre's 1974 novel was coming down a year later. Sabrina Spielrein at the center of A Dangerous Method would have been 102 years old, and the book was still six years away from publication. And Cowie Hart Hemmings of The Descendants was 12 years old. Of course, as Fred Allen once said, I can't understand why a person would take years to write a novel when he can easily buy one for a few dollars. <laughs> we, however, are thank thankful and honored that these people spent their time, their years, bringing the world the word, the written word, hello, new lips, the written word to life. The Edward J. Memorial Junior M Library has been home to Scripter for most of the award's 24 years. And this library, together with the magnificent Levy Library across the hall, the Quad, has seen, has been the intellectual and cultural center of the University of Southern California since this building opened in 1932. I don't know about a lot of you alumni, but we always thought this would be a great place to throw a party. And here we are today, and I don't suspect this is exactly the party we had in mind back then, but it's still pretty cool. This place, like a few others, has a combination of stately beauty and an air of great academic achievement. And on scripter evenings, this reference room undergoes a transformation into an elegant setting for our celebration. But that transformation does not happen by itself. It takes months of planning by the scripter event committee to create a special night like this, I'd like to honor the event committee members and ask them to stand so we can thank them for their thoughtful planning and dedication to this occasion. I know you're out there. It is, it is very gratifying to serve as the president of the Friends of the USC Library's Board of Directors and might I say, a whole lot less controversial than the Coliseum Commission. <laughs> and so many members of the Friends Board are dedicated not only to this event, but to the success of the USC Libraries and Dean Quinlan. And I'd like to ask the members of the Friends Board to please stand up and accept our thanks. As all of you know, the community that makes Scripter, the excellent event that it is, extends beyond the immediate Trojan family. Everyone who sponsored a table, donated services, placed an ad in the program, all of the studios, the agencies, and the managers who are here to support their films, the writers and screenwriters, all of whom are winners, all of you are essential to our success and it gives us great pleasure to honor all of your achievements and please join me in thanking them. And thank you, Ed Roski and his wife, Gail, for showing the flag for the Board of Trustees tonight. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to second the Dean's thanks to Valerie and Ron Sugar. It's often said the three keys to success at any nonprofit institution is the time, treasure, and talent from its supporters. And too often we honor the generosity of treasure. But in this instance, the benefactors have contributed even more of their time and talent. Ron as a longtime trustee, and Valerie as a valued member of the USC Friends of the Libraries Board. We're honored not only by their gift and their names, but also their vision and leadership. And thank you so much.
Now, all those masters of ceremonies that uh, Catherine talked about earlier, it's been my pleasure many times to invite our masters of ceremonies onto the stage at this point in the evening. We've had a lot of good ones there and a great deal of star power during our 24 years, and I'm grateful for every one of them. But as someone who loves this university and this library, and who views this library as one of the most essential and invaluable contributors to USC's academic achievements, I'm perhaps most excited when I get to invite our library's bold, vibrant, and might I say, very young and attractive leader to the stage as our mistress of ceremonies. I think it's mistress. An academic chair is endowed with honor not only by the benefactors who name it, but also the first holder of that char chair. And we could not be more honored by the visionary leader who holds that chair. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back the inaugural holder of the Valerie and Ronald Sugar Dean's Chair of the USC Libraries, our mistress of ceremonies, and the only virtuoso cellist outside of a music school to have a chair of her own, Dean Catherine Quinlan. Thank you, Glenn. The Scripter Literary Achievement Award was established in 2008 to honor writers and screenwriters who have contributed so significantly to the art of adaptation throughout their careers. The honorees make quite a list. Stephen Zalian, Michael Chabon, Eric Roth, and Dennis Lehane. And tonight, we add another name to that illustrious list, 2012 Scripter Literary Achievement Award winner, Paul Haggis. In addition to writing some of the most acclaimed films of the last decade, I'm sure you remember the scripture-winning adaptation Million Dollar Baby, Paul Haggis has won two Oscars for co-writing and directing Crash. He has written for a remarkable number of television genre, sitcoms like One Day at a Time, sketch comedy like The Tracy Ullman Show, and dramas like L.A. Law and 30-something. He has brought James Bond to the big screen in an adaptation of Casino Royale and an original story for Quantum of Solace and he has written the script for the most recent Call of Duty Modern Warfare video game. Yes, he has. We're a library, we do our research. <laughs> Which became the biggest selling game of all time within 24 hours of its release. I don't know if I should say this, I've never actually played a video game, but maybe I should try one. <laughs> Paul's is an, is an extraordinary talent, a talent for telling diverse stories in diverse ways and for engaging audiences who come to his narratives with a vast range of expectations. The impact of Paul Haggis' work extends beyond fictional settings into the real world, reaching people and places around the globe. Through his work with Artists for Peace and Justice, he has helped build schools, create jobs, and provide medical treatment to some of the poorest children in Haiti. He has credited his success in those efforts in part to, quote, a lot of imagination. His imagination grasps the creative potential in transforming one way of telling a story into another. His imagination makes use of the transformative power of stories to affect positive change in the real world. And it is precisely the sort of bold, intelligent, and inspiring imagination that we are proud to honor with the Scripture Literary Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our 2012 Scripture Literary Achievement Award winner, Paul Haggis. <laughs> Thank you. It took me forever to live down Walker, Texas Ranger. <laughs> now I'm going to live down this fucking game show. It's great. <laughs> Thank you for recognizing me as, uh, well, I understood as to be the best screenwriter in the world. I thought this was. <laughs> but the other one is fine. Uh, that's certainly what my parents thought. They, they encouraged me from a young age, largely because they saw that I wasn't good at much else. And uh, you have to be just a little emotionally unstable to be in this kind of profession. It's, it's, it's a ridiculous profession, writing. One of my favorite quotes uh, from the last year is from Albert Camus. All great deeds and all great thoughts have ridiculous beginnings. I could rewrite that a little bit make it a tad simpler. All great things have ridiculous beginnings. I'm very proud to be here with my daughters tonight, all three of whom grew up to choose ridiculous and difficult 
careers in writing, in art, and in music. We all want to protect our kids. We, we, we want them to be safe. But what does a safe life look like? You know? I'm afraid sometimes we protect our children too well, and I've been guilty of that. So I'm trying to learn the lesson my parents taught me, to encourage your children to be ridiculous, to take on ridiculous challenges, choose ridiculous careers. Because only by doing that do they have a chance really to be great. And that's what I wish for you, Alyssa and Lauren and Katie, the chance to be great. Thank you for this. It, it's a great honor, and, and I'm humbled to be here and accept this. Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed your dinners. I think I got it. Oh, good. Brent Sherman, if you're in the room, that is for you and your team. I was asked to give a shout out to the Dewey Decimal System by one of our guests this evening. So Mr. Fisher, consider this the shout out. So typically, <clears throat> at this point in the evening, the Master of Ceremonies demonstrates some talent, some capacity to entertain. You've all been really generous and really gracious as I talked to many of you earlier about, you know, I was doing great and keep up the good work and fight on. <laughs> you may not feel it though, but I assure you the pressure up here is intense. Even in front of this friendly crowd. It's just me up here and you're all out there <laughs> looking at me <laughs> expectantly. <laughs> What's she gonna do next? It's kind of nerve-wracking. So, I was thinking about what I was going to do, following this great list of wonderful MCs we've had in the past, and I thought, I'm not an MC. I'm a dean, and the inaugural holder of the Valerie and Ronald Sugar Dean's <laughs> Chair of USC Libraries. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe what I need is a little moral support. <laughs> you may not know this about musicians. First of all, I was one for some time. But we develop a deep affection for our instruments, and we often express that fondness by giving them names. For instance, my sister, I have many sisters and many brothers, but one of my sisters named her violin, Celine. My brother has a tuba called Bubba. <laughs> we said to him, like, really, Bubba? He goes, well, yeah, don't you think it looks like a Bubba? And we thought, yeah, okay, it looks like a Bubba. And as for me, well, I was not immune to that idea. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you all to Fred. <laughs> now as I, as I made my rounds uh, earlier on, I noticed that some people don't understand what black tie means. <laughs> there are some beautiful ties in the room, but the invitation does say black tie. And I would like to point out that Fred understands black tie. Fred is very, very reliable. One of the reasons I brought him with me this evening. He's also 300 years old, which I thought would make him the, by far the oldest person in the room, which by the, there makes me the youngest, feel the youngest person in the room. And the one thing about Fred that I particularly, particularly like is that he has never let me down. He's been with me since I was 11 years old through many of the most important, memorable, and traumatic <laughs> moments of my life. Like all of you, Fred is cultured, well-mannered, well-read, and he has an excellent lineage. He's well-traveled. He's attended operas, symphony concerts, musical theater, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, boat launches, and as you can tell by his adornments, he has an impressive number of frequent flyer miles to his name. <laughs> But sadly, Fred's activities have been somewhat curtailed the last few years. As the dean, I'm not really able to spend as much time with Fred or the three friends that he has at home as I would like. And as a result, he is spending more and more and more of his time, in his case, in the dark, all alone. So I thought he deserved a night out. So here he is. Yeah. 
Some of you may not know that Fred and I are Canadian. I was born there, and Fred became a citizen about 40 years ago. He's got his green card. I have lived in Los Angeles for several years now, and so I am not unfamiliar with certain stereotypes of Canadians held by many of our friends in the States, particularly with regard to my home province of Newfoundland. Uh-huh. First of all, you thought I was going to break into the hide and see major cello concerto. Now you think I'm going to tell Newfie jokes. <laughs> I don't want you to misunderstand this. I mean, I can take a joke, and I enjoy poking fun at myself as much as the next dean. Right, Dean Fuso? But I really just don't understand what is so goddamn funny about Newfoundlanders. You know, we have a couple of unique habits that may seem a little peculiar to the uninitiated, un uninitiated like mummering. We go mummering in the winter, and we go cod jigging in the summer. And the names of our cities and towns may seem, I think they're charming, but some people think they're unusual. But who wouldn't want to spend a weekend in the village of Heart's Delight? I had a house in Heart's Delight when I lived in Newfoundland. Or its neighbor to the north, Heart's Desire. Or its neighbor to the east, Heart's Content. <laughs> you sense a theme here. <laughs> or how about a week in the town of Happy Adventure? Who wouldn't enjoy an occasional cruise around Whitless Bay? And I think we all know a couple of people who are still on that boat on Whitless Bay. And true enough, if you ever find yourself in Whitless Bay or Happy Adventure, you'll notice that Newfoundland cuisine is also somewhat distinctive. For example, one of our favorite dishes, favorite dishes, you cannot go into the best restaurant in St. John's, the capital city, and not find this on the menu. Chips, dressing, and gravy. That is French fries, turkey stuffing, smothered in gravy. It's just like that other great Canadian dish, poutine, except without the cheese curds, and therefore it has no redeeming nutritional value at all. Our unofficial provincial drink is a powerful rum called Screech. And because Newfoundland is essentially a rock in the sea and somewhat isolated, we learned to reuse and recycle long before it became fashionable. So if you visit Newfoundland and your bar barrel of Screech runs empty, you're not entirely out of luck because you can still make that other provincial drink, Swish. Swish is easy to make. I've done it myself. <laughs> and you can even do this at home. If you happen to have an empty barrel that was once full of potent spirits, you just pull in a couple of gallons of boiling water and you slosh it about. The hot water draws out the dregs of rum that's soaked into the barrel's wooden slats and when the mixture cools enough to drink, you have a few bottles worth of Newfoundland Swish. And let me assure you, it is as delicious to drink as it sounds. <laughs> That's why you drink it after you drank the rum and barrel. <laughs> now that I've told you some of these details about my home province, I know some of you will really, really, really want to visit. We Newfies are a warm and welcoming people. So much so, in fact, that we have a traditional swearing-in ritual to induct outsiders as honorary Newfoundlanders. You may be wondering, how can I become a Newfie too? <laughs> or you may not be wondering, <laughs> what do I have to do to become a Newfie? Become a Dean? Play the cello? Spend the night in happy adventure? Eat a slice of seal flipper pie? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> down an entire vat of brewers and scrunchions, a bowl of navel beef, which is exactly what it says it is. All you have to do is drink a shot of screech and kiss a codfish on the lips. It's not really difficult, but you have to mean it. <laughs> and one final comment about Newfoundland. Its capital, St. John's, is officially the foggiest, rainiest, coldest, windiest, wettest, and most cloud-covered city in all of Canada. It will come, therefore, as no surprise to any of you that thanks to the nine months of snow, yes, I swear to God, it snows in June, the cold, the screech, and the swish, 
Newfoundland has one of the fastest rising birth rates in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> now, many Canadian stereotypes are not province specific. We have a few Canadians with us tonight, don't we, Paul? I'm sure he knows what I mean. Newfoundland, Ontario, British Columbia, it just doesn't seem to matter. Apparently, to the rest of the world, it's just funny being from Canada. <laughs> Who knew? Everyone thinks all Canadians end every sentence with A. Paul got through his whole speech without doing that. And I think I've done okay tonight. But whenever I meet someone, they go, you're from Canada, say A. <laughs> all right. They think that we're a bit overly polite and that we are direct in our speech, though always in an overly polite way. So I'm gonna take advantage of that particular stereotype to be rather direct right now. I have a question for all of the entertainment industry talent in the room tonight. You listening? Where in God's name are all the movies about librarians? <laughs> Those of us who work in the library world know that libraries are places of poignant drama and high comedy sometimes low comedy and a tragedy or two. So my question to all the writers, producers, and agents here tonight is, where are all the library movies? Paul, now that LA Law is off the air, what about LA Librarian? I mean, come on, can't one of those desperate housewives be a librarian? They should do something with their time. And we have a few examples here and there. Shirley Jones of Partridge Family fame played Marion the Librarian in the film adaptation of The Music Man. A ghostly librarian makes an appearance at New York Public Library in Ghostbusters. And my all-time favorite cinematic librarian returned to the big screen this year in a script or eligible adaptation, Conan the Librarian. <laughs> I couldn't help it. <laughs> now, lest he thinks his responsibilities for the evening have concluded, I'd like to invite Taylor Hackford back to the stage. I mentioned a few of Taylor's creative accomplishments earlier, and I heard a few others about some of your friends that are sitting right over there, Taylor. You might want to talk to them. Though you may not know that he was also once president of USC's undergraduate student government, that in 2010, he received the USC Alumni Association's most prestigious honor, the Ace of E. Call Alumni Achievement Award. As he mentioned earlier, he also lived on campus in Marks Hall, which he has described as USC original animal house. Please welcome Taylor Hackford. I want to um, talk about adaptation. In the film industry, everything comes from a source. You either write an original screenplay, as Paul has done, or you adapt uh, a novel, which Paul has done. Uh, the fact is that adaptation is a very, very difficult, difficult art form. Writing from scratch, sitting down and looking at the blank page and conceiving a story, conceiving characters, is incredibly difficult. You think, well, that's really hard. Taking a novel has got to be easy, especially a great novel, something that everybody has read. The problem is a novel is a novel. Source material is very specific. It's meant to be read. It doesn't necessarily jump off the screen, even though you love it and you love the characters. It's very difficult to make it into a film. I want to talk personally. I made a film. I made several adaptations, but I made a film a few years ago called Dolores Claiborne. It was a film that came from a best-selling novel by one of the best-selling authors in this country, in the world, Stephen King. Now, I had not read the novel. I read a screenplay that was given to me by a company called Castle Rock, a very good company, that had all the rights to Stephen King's work. <clears throat> And it was written by a screenwriter named Tony Gilroy, who I ended up by collaborating with many times. He's a very close friend of mine and was my creative partner on the films we worked on together. He's now directing. But Tony had written this screenplay, and I read it, and I really liked it. And I decided to take a meeting with the people at Castle Rock, and I 
they liked me, and we said, let's work on this together. And I thought, hmm, came from a novel, I better read it. Now, I read the novel, and it turned out that half of the screenplay was not in the novel at all, half of it. The novel was about <clears throat> a woman in Maine. And by the way, Kathleen, we shot in Nova Scotia. So I spent my time in Canada also. Uh, but in any event, in the novel, it's about a woman who at the beginning is accused of killing, she's a housekeeper, and she's accused of killing her employer, a woman, a rich woman she worked for. And she goes into a police station and she talks about the fact that, no, I didn't kill my employer, but I did kill my husband 25 years ago. Surprise. Now, Stephen King is very interesting, perverse, very popular, very good author. And it was very interesting because this was a woman's story and a fascinating woman's story. But Tony Gilroy had looked at this, and in the story, and I, won't, I don't want to go into too much depth about it, and maybe you've seen the film, it's about the, probably the worst thing that could ever happen in the human condition. It's about a father molesting his daughter. And I can't think of anything that's worse in the world. And the story that she tells is about the past. It's about this experience and it's about the fact that she found out and she killed her husband. Now, Tony, as an adapter, as a screenwriter, thought about this and he said, you know what? This is a terrible thing. It does go on in the world. And these girls are affected and of course they're never going to say anything about it, ever, in their life. But these girls grow up to be women, and they're carrying this with them for their entire life. And so he wrote a screenplay about a woman who is accused, who hasn't talked to her daughter in 20 years, and the daughter, played by Jennifer Jason Lee, who comes back to deal with her mother after all this time. It was a film about ghosts. It's a film that take, took place in two different time periods. For a filmmaker, it was a fantastic opportunity because I was able to tell two stories simultaneously in two different time periods, and it called upon my talents to do that. But Tony had done this adaptation. Now, the, the essence of the story is that I worked with him on two drafts. We got ready to shoot, and at a certain point, Castle Rock said, oh, we have to send the script to Stephen King because he's never seen it. He doesn't know anything about it, and I went, does he have control? He's, they said, oh, yes, absolutely. If he says no, we can't make the movie. And I went, oh, my God, I've been spending four months on this film? He's obviously not going to agree to it. it is, half of this screenplay is not in the book. It's, you know, they sent it to him. I got a personal letter from him. He said, Mr. Hackford, thank you so much for sending me Tony Gilbert's screenplay. I loved it. What a great idea. I wish I'd thought of it myself. <laughs> Generosity an artist appreciating what another artist had done with that work because Tony had been true to the work. Tony had seen an inherent issue and took Selena, the 13-year-old girl, and made her an adult, Jennifer Jason Lee. I had, I had a young actress and I had Jennifer Jason Lee playing the role. I want, that's adaptation. And what I think is important about adaptation is that when you go to make a film, you must be true to the source material, crucial. But at the same time, if you slavishly try to put what's on the book, in the book, on the screen, I guarantee you Dolores Claiborne would not have been as an interesting a movie because it would have been one woman sitting in a police station telling a story. It would have been one story instead of two. And it was a much more profound story about this issue, this problem. So I just want to give you that personal bit of, you know, as a filmmaker, Personal bit of experience, I want to talk, this is a night for writers. I want to celebrate my par creative partner, Tony Gilroy, for coming up with this idea and carrying it forward. The boldness of him going into this and doing it, I think, made for, and the evidence was that it's Stephen King's favorite film from his books. I thought that was just an incredible testament to what Tony had done. And hopefully I had something to it. So I wanted to, you know, we're going into the area of awards and into adaptation. And Kathleen asked me to tell a personal story about adaptation. That's it. It's a real art form. And, and so important and fragile uh, that you've been given this responsibility of something that is a literary work. 
But don't be too conservative. Grow, adapt, and make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Conan the Barbarian was only one of the 109 eligible adaptations this year. The members of our script and selection committee and its two eminent co-chairs were busier than ever. This is the fifth year that Naomi Foner has chaired the committee, and I am incredibly grateful for the incredible time and effort Naomi has dedicated to Scripter, particularly given how busy she is with her own creative endeavors. Naomi wrote the screen adaptation of Myla Goldberg's novel, Bee Season. She also wrote the screenplays for Losing Isaiah, A Dangerous Woman, and the Golden Globe winning Running on Empty. She is currently working on Very Good Girls, which she plans to direct and for which she wrote the original screenplay. This year, one of our distinguished USC faculty members joined Naomi as co-chair of the selection committee. Howard Rodman has been a longtime selection committee member and supporter of Scripter and our libraries. When he's not busy with his committee duties, he serves as vice president of the Writers Guild of America West, artistic director of Sundance Screenwriting Labs, and he teaches screenwriting to some of the world's most talented students at the USC School of Cinematic Arts. Please join me in welcoming our, welcoming our 2012 Scripter Selection Committee co-chairs, Naomi Foner and Howard Rodman. Thank you, Catherine. Or as Hal Cantor would say, thank you, Catherine, for that very generous introduction I beg you to give me. <laughs> Participating in the selection of Scripter winners, as we've done for several years now, carries many pleasures and many rewards, but I would like to mention a few of them. As a writer and as a professor of writing, I treasure every opportunity to reward writing well done. I'm equally thrilled to draw attention to the writer as the foundational creative force in literature and film, the person who builds a world, the person who creates something from nothing. And finally, my hope would be to inspire and encourage the work and perse perseverance of our students at USC and the other talented writers in Los Angeles and around the world whose adaptations we'll be honoring 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. This library, all the libraries at USC, are absolutely critical to these endeavors. Show me a writer and I'll show you a reader. Show me a reader and I will show you someone whose temple is the library. Libraries are where I spent my childhood, my youth, my young adulthood. I bet that's true of just about every writer in this room. It is within walls of books that we found our home. Whether we want to turn the world upside down or simply reveal the beauty that's already here, we learn to see far by looking near, by thumbing through card catalogs, by filling out request forms, by indulging in the feel, weight, aroma of the book, the dense syncopated architecture of rows of books, as Borges says, the universe, which others call the library. This particular library inspires, encourages, and makes possible the caliber the caliber of creative work that we enjoy from USC and that we celebrate each year at Scripter. As a member of the faculty, as a writer, and as a reader, it's a gratifying experience to bring well-deserved attention to the library's inspired, central, transformative role in the creative life of this community. And of course, it's a great honor, as well as a true pleasure, to work with Naomi Foner who I know would like to say a few words before we announce tonight's winners. Thank you, Naomi. Well, I thought, since you were dressed in a tuxedo, and I'm all gussied up, we could, uh, we could do Fred and Ginger down sure. the center of the sure. library. <laughs> there were 109 adaptations that were eligible for Scripter this year. Um, and that's more than there ever were before and a very difficult task picking from among those five finalists and one winning adaptation. I, I don't even like to consider it that way. I think it's, you know, apples and oranges, and each one is wonderful in its own way, and every single one of the films that were nominated this year are remarkable. So um, 
let's consider them all winners, despite only one of them being able to take home the Scripter Award. But the people who went through the 109 movies and occasionally actually read some of the 109 books, uh, are, oh, we owe them great thanks, the selection committee. And I would like to thank them for the dedication to the USC libraries and the Scripture Awards and their time and their effort and ask them please to stand and be acknowledged at this moment. The members of our Scripture Selection Committee. I have a, a unique provenance for being here tonight. Um, my date tonight is my father, who will turn 94 next week, and who took me to the library every Saturday morning of my childhood to choose two or three books to take home. For my father, libraries were sacred places, and he passed that feeling on to me. I remember him saying very clearly, you will never be alone if you have a book. So I'm very glad to have him with me tonight. I was taken to the library, and I was also taken to the big movie theater on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn, where my brother and I were left to watch two cartoons, one nature film, the B feature, and almost never the A feature, because we were picked up too early for it. And we sat in this row of seats where there was a matron with a flashlight who would shine it in your face if you made too much noise. But the combination of those things were pretty indelible. And um, the fact that this is a place where both books and movies are honored is quite a wonderful thing for me, and I think for most of us. Um, I, like. Taylor tried to explain to you and did very well, doing an adaptation is an extremely difficult task. It requires a kind of alchemy. It's almost a magic thing. You have to take a book which is beloved by many or a play or an, an, another form that, where it started and turn it into something completely different in an original way and at the same time maintain the essence of what it was to begin with, so as not to disturb the people who love the original, and yet to do something transformational to it. It's very difficult, and when it happens, it is magic. So now I would like to acknowledge all of the people who did it so well this year, both our authors and our screenwriters, who in very many cases work together with great generosity, in some cases, that was impossible. Um, Charlotte Bronte is no longer around to collaborate with. But where it is possible, it's amazing how often the generosity goes back and forth. And as I like to say to an author whose book I'm going to adapt, I can't hurt your book. You have it forever. It's a safer place to be, but it is still requires a lot of generosity. So. Um, all of you who are here tonight, please stand as I call your names. These are the five finalists. For A Dangerous Method, screenwriter and playwright, Christopher Hampton, and author John Kerr. For The Descendants, screenwriters, Nate Faxon, Alexander Payne, and Jim Rash, and author Cowie Hart Hemmings. For Jane Eyre, screenwriter Moira Buffini and Charlotte Bronte. For Moneyball, screenwriters Stan Chervin, Aaron Sorkin, and Steve Zalian, and author Michael Lewis. For Tinker Taylor, Soldier Spy, screenwriters Bridget O'Connor and and Peter Strahan, Strahan and author John Le Carrier. <laughs> Thank you.
please join me in a big round of applause for every one of the writers in this excellent group. Before we reveal who will take home the script or award, let's take a look at a few clips from the movies of our finalists. discovered it chose an inside. It's not a question of sides. I have to work in the direction my instinct tells my intelligence is the right one. Don't forget, you cured me with his method. What I'll never accept is that what we understand has got us nowhere. We have to go into uncharted territory. We have to go back to the sources of everything we believe. I don't want to just open the door and show the patient his illness, squatting there like a toad. I want to try and find a way to help the patient reinvent himself, to send him off on a journey at the end of which is waiting the person he was always intended to be. It's no good making yourself ill in the process. cheating on you. That is what we fought about. When I was home at Christmas, I caught her with a guy. It made me sick to see her near you. I went back to school thinking that that was it, that I was just done with her. I was going to call and tell you everything. And, and then the accident happened, and I was waiting until she woke up, I guess. You didn't even suspect, right? Right? You're disgusted me too. You're always so busy. Caught her with a guy. What does that mean? I was on my way to swim in the Black Point pool with Brandy, and suddenly I see Mom and some douchebag walking into a house. His house, I guess. Just some guy. It could be anybody. And he had his hand on her ass. Am I a machine without feelings? Do you think that because I am poor, obscure, plain and little, that I am soulless and heartless? I have as much soul as you and full as much heart, and if God had blessed me with beauty and wealth, I could make it as hard for you to leave me as it is for I to leave you. I'm not speaking to you through mortal flesh. It is my spirit that addresses your spirit, as if we'd passed through the grave and stood at God's feet equal, as we are. As we are. I am a free human being with an independent will which I now exert to leave you. Then let your will decide your destiny. I offer you my hand, my heart. Jane, I ask you to pass through life at my side. You are my equal and my likeness. Will you marry me?
Hi, Mr. Schott. It's uh, Peter Brand. I apologize for putting you on hold earlier. Billy asked me to call you back. He's on another line. No, we want two hundred twenty-five thousand for Rincon. Billy says he needs two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for Ricardo Rincon. Please. Yes, I, I added the please at the end. Uh, okay, let me t hold on one second, please. Tell him I'll pay for him. But when I when I sell him back for twice the amount next year, I keep the money. Okay, so Billy says he'll pay for Rincon himself, but when he sells him for more money next year, he's keeping the profit. Okay, thank you very much. We'll call you back. Thank you. Come on! Come on! Where did you get this? I didn't. Percy and his little cabal walked in with it. Look, control. Shut up. Style appalling. Patently a fabrication from beginning to end. Just could be the real thing. Well, if it's genuine, it's gold dust. But its topicality makes it suspect. Smiley is suspicious, Percy. Where did it come from? What's the access? A new secret source of mine. But how could he possibly have access? He has access to the most sensitive levels of policy making. We've named the operation Witchcraft. Well, Percy and his pals bypassed us, Smiley, gone straight to the minister. Percy has been allowed to keep the identity of his new friend top secret. <laughs> Now, if Glenn Sonnenberg and Dean Quinlan would join us on the stage. It's time to announce who takes home the scripter. I, I, I think everybody who's looked at these movies, who's seen the whole movies, know that they are all remarkable and they're all winners. So this is just who's going to have the, the award on their desk. <laughs> The uh, winner of the Scripter Award for this year is The Descendants. <laughs> <laughs> Author Howie Hard Hemmings, screenwriters Alexander Kane, Nate Faxon, and Jim Rath. <laughs> three of us we'll start okay um thank you so much this is uh, such a great honor uh, oh it is heavy um you know it's so uh what's ironic see how much my head is bouncing light off of this thing um if we could get some pancake i'm so sorry can we get fast. some pancake for my <laughs> some powder uh you know what's so ironic is that um uh claudia lewis we just pitched a librarian movie at, during dinner um <laughs> It's called Overdue, Bloodthirst, and the Card Catalog. It's sort of an action horror movie, so we're really excited. Just got greenlit. Um, so. Did you sign Dean Quillen to be in it? Yes, yes. So, so we uh, screen test tomorrow, so we have to get ready for it. It, actually, it also has a very big role for Fred, so you'll be yeah. happy to know that. Good. Um, I, this is such a, a wonderful honor, and to be part of something... Uh, that celebrates and puts books on a pedestal, and and none of this would have been possible without uh, Cowie's wonderful book. Of course, we all share this award, and with Alexander Payne, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, it was such a great journey for us to fall in love with a book and have the opportunity to turn it into uh, the film that you've seen. Um, so, from for me, thank you so much uh, to the USC Libraries and Scripter Award, and uh, you want to speak? 
say something. You yeah, say know. something. You never know. Um, <laughs> no, I am so thankful, too, for um, everyone here tonight and for uh, USC and being at a library to get an award. This is wonderful. Um, when my book first came out in 2007, I think I, I did a reading at uh, my local bookstore in San Francisco, and um, I think about 10 people came, and my publisher sprung for some crackers and a block of sharp cheddar, and <laughs> this is so much better. <laughs> so I'm very thankful, and you know, an adaptation can sometimes bring so many more readers that I never would have had, and to have those readers say that they love both the book and the film and that they work so well together um, is such a blessing, if I may use that word, but I'm very thankful for you both um, for making such, creating such a great script that I can be so proud of, so thank you. Um. Yeah, I, I feel uh, not as smart as I should be in this huge, amazing room. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I feel like I would have been I would have been smarter had I gone to USC and studied here. Um, yeah, uh, mostly just because I would have been in my seat here studying and thought about the long trek, the seven flights down to the bathroom, and probably just continued working as opposed to having to do that. Um, but I am also extremely thankful to be here. Um, I am also um, thankful to Alexander Payne uh, for directing such a beautiful film. And, um, and I think he was right in the end. It was a good call um, casting George Clooney and not me. That, was, that ended up being, I think, a benefit. And looking back, I think that was a positive thing. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but this is a huge honor, and um, just to be in this room and, and to be surrounded with, with all of you, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and, and, and a special thanks to Cowie for a, a gorgeous novel that, that we lucky, were lucky enough to get our hands on, so thank you. Congratulations to all of our 2012 script rewardees, Cowie Hart Hemmings, Matt Faxon, Alexander Payne, and Jim Rash, and Literary Achievement Award winner, Paul Haggis. Before we conclude the formal part of tonight's program, I'd like to issue everyone a special early invitation to Scripture 2013. Next year, we will celebrate the 25th anniversary of this excellent event. And I must say, I really appreciate it as I've been able to talk with a number of you this evening. You all have ideas. So if you have any more ideas, please feel free to come up and tell me them at the after party. I know that Glenn and other members of the event committee already are thinking about ways to make the 25th scripture the best ever. And I hope you'll help us do that. And I also hope that you will join us in 2013 for what is sure to be a landmark occasion for our libraries and for USC. I'd like to invite you to join Fred and me at the after party down the hall, where we'll continue celebrating with our finalists, winners, and selection committee members. And we'll enjoy some jazz played by students from the Thornton School of Music. But to conclude this evening, I'd like to call upon Taylor Hackford to say a few more words and to send us off into this evening by 10 p.m. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, mention one other thing. As, uh, as Kathleen said, at the end of my career at USC, I was student body president here. And I, it was 1967. And I invited the great American poet, Allen Ginsberg, to campus to read his poetry. Now, in 1967, USC was a bastion of uh, political conservatism and inviting a gay hippie poet to this campus was uh, somewhat controversial. But I must say, uh, the university rose to the occasion. Alan read in the park right out front, and between 1,500 and 2,000 students came to hear him read. It was an incredible success. 
Before that reading, he came into this building and had a lunch with the faculty of this library. And afterwards, he told me, he said, uh, I said, how was it? He said, they were fantastic. They were completely hip. And he said, what else could they be? They worship literature. And I think the message that he had visiting this university, visiting this building, is the message you should take with you tonight. Revere what this, this university and this library represent. See it grow. And let's keep our temple, as it was described, literature and books. Thank you so very much for being here tonight. <laughs>